Hello. So we're going to continue with our discussion of Chapter 16, looking at entropy changes and free energy. So last time we talked about what free energy was and how to relate the signs of entropy, enthalpy, and free energy to determine if a reaction would occur spontaneously or not and in what direction. And now we're going to look at how to calculate delta G. So first let's look at entropy changes in chemical reactions. Well, so far we focus on only physical processes, things dissolving um, or changing state. And now we're going to look at chemical reactions since that's the foundation of chemistry. In the surroundings, entropy change is determined by heat flow, whether or not heat flows into the surroundings from the system or the reverse. Entropy changes in the system are more determined by positional probability. We're going to look at what that means. Okay, so if you have a chemical reaction that produces fewer moles of molecules than what you started with, this means that you have fewer possible configurations. Like we talked about last time, free energy is partly and entropy are partly based on probability. The more likely disorder is to occur, the you know the larger the entropy value will be. So if we have this reaction of nitrogen with hydrogen gas producing ammonia. Um, and then another reaction of hydrogen gas breaking apart, let's look at whether or not these would create more positional disorder. So for reactions involving gases, if the number of molecules is larger in the products than the reactants, then the change in entropy is going to be positive. So if we look at our first reaction, we have one mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen, so we have four moles on the reactant side versus two moles on the product side. What this means is that our entropy, or a change in entropy, is going to be negative because we're reducing the number of configurations, we're reducing the probability. If we look at our other equation, we have one mole of H2 going to two moles of hydrogen atoms, and so that is increasing the number of molecules, which is going to give us a positive change in entropy because we're increasing the probability, or increasing the number of configurations. Okay, so let's look at an example. So we're going to predict the sign of the change in entropy for each of the following reactions. Okay, so if we'll take a look at this one, we have one mole of calcium carbonate versus two moles overall of our calcium oxide and our carbon dioxide. So this would give a positive change in entropy. For our second one, we have two moles plus one of our oxygen, so three moles total versus two moles of our SO3 gas, and that's going to give us a negative change in entropy because we're reducing the number of molecules that we're producing. Okay, well, the third law of thermodynamics also comes into play here. Third law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of a perfect crystal, so something that's completely organized, at zero Kelvin is zero. And so we can use this law to calculate the entropy of particular substances at certain temperatures since we kind of know at zero Kelvin at zero we can calculate from there to find entropy of certain substances at certain temperatures. Because entropy is a state function, which means it doesn't matter the pathway to get there, uh, we're just looking at the change, we can use standard entropy values to find the change in entropy. And because entropy is an extensive property, which means it depends on quantity, we must incorporate the number of moles into our calculation. And so this is how you can also find the change in entropy for a reaction by taking the sum of the moles times the standard entropies for those particular products minus the number of moles times the standard entropy for the reactants. So let's look at an example of that. Okay, so we want to calculate the change in entropy at 25 Celsius for the reaction to nickel 2 sulfide plus oxygen gas goes to sulfur dioxide and nickel 2 oxide. And we have these standard entropy values. And so we know that the change in entropy is equal to the sum of the products times their moles minus the sum of the reactants times their number of moles. So let's start with our first product, which is our SO2. And SO2 has a delta S, or has a standard entropy, excuse me, of 248 joules per Kelvin mole. And this should be a superscript zero. Uh, plus, our other product is the nickel 2 oxide, and its standard entropy is 38. So those are our products, and now we're going to subtract our reactants times their number of moles. So our first reactant is the nickel 2 sulfide, and we have two of those times 53. Plus, our oxygen gas is 
3 moles times the oxygen gas entropy is 205. Okay, and so then it, um, I've already gone through and calculated these. So we get 496 plus 76, probably do this without calculator, minus the quantity 106 plus 615. And if we take this quantity minus our reactant quantity, we should get negative 149 joules per Kelvin. Now, if we look at the reaction, we had... 5 moles on the reactant side and 4 moles on the product side. So we would expect that delta S would be negative because we're decreasing the number of moles, and that's what we get. Well, let's look at how complex molecules can affect our change in entropy. If we have this reaction of aluminum oxide and hydrogen gas, we have 4 moles on the reactant side going to aluminum and water, and we have 5 moles on the product side. We would expect our delta S to be positive, but we wouldn't expect it to be very large because the difference in the number of moles isn't very big. Well, if we go through and calculate, we get that our value is positive 179. So it was positive, but this value is quite large compared to what we expected it to be. And the reason for that has to do with the difference between the entropy for hydrogen and the entropy for water. Entropy values for water are much larger due to the fact that it's a much more complex molecule than hydrogen gas. Water also ha is a polar molecule. Its you know, bonds between the hydrogen and oxygen are very strong, and this affects the entropy. So in general, the more complex the molecule, the higher the standard entropy. And so that's part of the reason why this change in entropy is so large. Okay, so we've looked at how to calculate entropy. Now let's look at how to incorporate free energy, or delta G, into chemical reactions. There are three methods that you can use to calculate the change in free energy. We can calculate the change in free energy directly. We can't measure it. And so we have to use other measured quantities to calculate this value. And so we can compare the delta G from several reactions and compare them to see which one is going to go to equilibrium and how far to the right it's going to be. And so the more negative the delta G, the further to the product side or to the right the equilibrium will lie. And we can use delta G from different reactions to compare them. One way to calculate the change in free energy is to take the change in enthalpy minus the temperature times the change in entropy. So delta G is temperature dependent. So let's look an example, at an example of that. Okay, so I'm going to consider the reaction given here. We've got sulfur dioxide and oxygen gas producing sulfur trioxide, or SO3. Mon yeah, sulfur dioxide. Uh, it's carried out at 25 Celsius in one atmosphere. Okay, so we want to calculate delta H, delta S, and delta G. And they've given us some data, which, if you remember, we can find all of this information in the appendix in your book, or these are things that you could look up, but we're just giving them here to make it a little easier. Okay, so let's do delta H first. Well, we know that we can find delta H by taking the sum of the products times their number of moles minus the sum of the reactants times their number of moles, just like we did for entropy a few slides back. So let's do that one first. We've got our SO3 is our product, and there are two moles of it. So we've got 2 times negative 3, 96, because that's our delta H for the SO3. Now we're going to subtract that from our reactants. We have 2 moles of SO2 which is negative 297, and we're going to add that to our 1 mole of O2, and the delta H for O2 is 0. Okay, and so if we go through and we calculate this, and I'm just going to give you the answer because I assume that we should all be able to calculate. However, you could always pause the video here, calculate, and check your answer with mine. We should get negative 198 kilojoules. Okay, so let's go on to find delta S. Well, we're going to find delta S in a similar fashion because we just recently looked at how to use this method to find the change in entropy. And so first we're going to take our products, which is our SO3, and our delta S for SO3 is 257. And if you notice, our units are different. This is joules per Kelvin mole versus kilojoules per mole. That's our product, and now we're going to subtract our reactants. So we've got our two for our SO2, and the S for SO2 is 248, and we're going to add our one mole of oxygen, and here we do have a value of entropy for oxygen, which is 205. And if we go through and calculate this, again, you could pause if you'd like, and then check your answer with mine. Um, we should get 
can't read my writing, 187, negative, sorry, negative 187, and this is joules per Kelvin since our moles were multiplied by the moles for each of the reactants and products. So now we want to find our delta G. Okay, and our delta S was negative, and we went from 3 moles to 2 moles, and so that makes sense in keeping with what we talked about previously about the if we have less moles or less number of molecules produces products, then our delta S is going to be negative. Okay, well, we can find delta G using delta H minus T delta S. Well, we've already calculated delta H and delta S, so we should just be able to plug these in. However, we do also need to look at our units. We have kilojoules and joules, so we're going to also need to fix that. So our delta H is negative 198 kilojoules minus our temperature was 25 Celsius. We know that this is 298 Kelvin. And our joules, we're going to convert to kilojoules, so we would move our decimal one, two, three spots. So this is 0. Point, I'm sorry, this is also negative. Negative 0 0.187 kilojoules per Kelvin. And if we multiply all of these together, in the end we should get a delta G of negative 142 kilojoules, which means that this reaction will be spontaneous because the delta G is negative. Okay, well, a second way that we can calculate free energy is based on the fact that free energy is a state function. So we can calculate it similar to how we would find delta H using Hess's law, where we take all of our reactions and uh, rearrange them to get the overall reaction and then add up our delta H's. We can do the same thing with delta G. So let's look at an example of that. Okay, so using the following data at 25 Celsius, uh, we want to calculate delta G for this reaction. So if I start with my first reactant, which is carbon in diamond form, that would be this reaction here, and I've got them both as reactants, and the quantity is the same. So I'm just going to rewrite it, and I'm just going to use D for diamond, just to make things a little faster. Okay, and our delta G for this reaction is 9397 kilojoules. So now if I go to my product, carbon as graphite, well in this reaction I have carbon as graphite, but I w it's a reactant and I want it as a product. So I'm going to flip my reaction or reverse it, which makes my delta G positive. You remember from Hess's law, every time we flip a reaction we change the sign, or we could multiply a reaction through by some coefficient, which also multiplies the delta G by that coefficient. So if I flip this reaction, I'm going to get CO2 as my reactant and carbon graphite and oxygen gas as my products and my delta G here is positive 394 kilojoules. So now I'm going to add these up. My carbon dioxide cancels, my oxygen cancels. I'm left with carbon in diamond form goes to carbon in graphite form. Whoops, that's not a parenthesis. There we go. Uh, and my change in free energy is negative 3 kilojoules, which means that this reaction is spontaneous, and this reaction is spontaneous, it just occurs extremely slowly. Um, and so we could do the reverse reaction, going from graphite to diamond, um, under high pressure and high temperature, and half of all industrial diamonds, like used in industry for cutting because diamond is so sharp, are produced in this manner. We take carbon as graphite, convert it to diamond by applying high temperature and high pressure. Okay, the third method to find the free energy is to use standard free energies of formation. And so basically, here's the definition for standard free energy. It's the change in free energy that accompanies the formation of one mole of that substance from its constituent elements with all reactants and products in their standard states. So we take our reaction, we break it up into all the atoms, and then we form it into the products and figure out the delta G, similar to what we have done for delta H and for delta S. Okay, and here's the reaction, or sorry, the equation that we can use to do that. We take the sum of all of our products times their number of moles minus the sum of all of our reactants times their number of moles. So let's try an example with that. Okay, so we have uh, the reaction for methanol. So we have our methanol plus oxygen gas goes to carbon dioxide and water. This is the combustion reaction. And we have all the free energies of formation, or the delta Gs. So if we wanted to find the delta G for the reaction, we would take all the products minus the sum of all the reactants. So first, we've got two carbon dioxides, and our free energy for carbon dioxide is negative 394 kilojoules per mole, plus our four moles of water times its free energy, which is negative 229. 
that quantity minus the sum of our reactants. So our first reactant is methanol, and we have two moles of that times our negative 163, plus three moles of our oxygen, and you'll notice that for an element, the delta G is zero. Okay, and so again, we could calculate all of this, and if you want to pause and double check it on your own, so it's good to check my math, I might make a mistake, um, we should get negative 1,378 kilojoules. And because this delta G is large and negative, this means that it's going to be favorable thermodynamically. And so then it will occur spontaneously. Okay, so we've talked about how to calculate delta S, and we've talked about the three methods that you can use to calculate delta G. And so now we're going to practice that um, those types of problems, um, and then we'll go over uh, the notes in class and then give you guys some time to work on homework. Have a good day.